Welcome back to Inside the Factory. Uh, I'm Aaron, and I'm joined today by uh, one very familiar face, Sasha, and by a new guest, uh, Peter Thompson. Peter, would you mind introducing yourself for the audience? Yeah, hi, I'm Peter Thompson. Pleased to meet you all. Uh, I lead the Building and Infrastructure Design Products team, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. This is my very first Inside the Factory event, so I'm pleased to be here. Happy to have you here. Uh, today we're getting into a discussion about our vision. And first, we call, we call this organization BID, or Building Infrastructure Design. Um, so, Peter, could you tell us a little bit about what that means? Absolutely. So the team develops what you'll find mostly in the AEC collection. Um, we cover design applications, so Revit, Civil 3D, InfraWorks, Advanced Steel, we also have conceptual design with Formit and all of the MEP fabrication products. We produce, um, we develop the analysis applications, that's Insight, Robot Structural Analysis and Structural Bridge Design. And we also have generative design. Uh, we develop Dynamo and uh, the recent implementation of uh, generative design in Revit. And then uh, we also have the recap uh, product family for uh, reality capture for the built environment. So it's a pretty wide ranging uh, product set. Well, you know, on this, uh, in this series, we've been pretty real. Uh, so uh, <laughs> to jump right in, you know, there've been some comments recently about the need to rework some of these products, particularly Revit. Is that something that's top of mind for you? Oh yeah, very much so. And it's been top of mind for a long time. You know, in, in these um, inside the factory discussion sessions, um, Harlan and, and Sasha and others have been talking about that need to balance the here and now with the future, with extending into new markets and so on. But I think what we've taken from the recent conversations um, around Revit particularly, but not just Revit, really across all of our applications is uh, that we really need to focus on the here and now um, to make sure that we you know, fix what we started um, and um, make, make sure that we continue to build out the key and core functionality of those products. But we have that balancing act because we also need to make sure that we really uh, think about the future. And that's, you know, we've been doing that for many years um, and, uh, you know, we've made some announcements that uh, we've maybe not carried through on as, um, you know, Autodesk as a company, not just us. Um, so I, I think uh, it is very much top of mind. So, uh, you know, what actions has your team taken to explore that future? So, uh, as I say, we've been doing this for many years, but I think the, the, uh, the one that has really brought together all of both building products and infrastructure products is something that we call internally, and this is not something we're looking to market externally as a name, but because we are the bid team, um, we've been looking at something called the bid vision. So let me explain a little bit about the bid vision. The bid vision really is trying to take a 10 year view, forecasting where we want our customers to be in 10 years. Um, and uh, we've gone through validation exercises of that as well. But um, what we don't want to talk about particularly is that 10 year state. Uh, that 10 year state is, you know, it's too tenuous, it's too nebulous, it's kind of visionary, it's dreaming, it's, but we need that North Star. Once we've got that North Star, we're working, now working backwards, we're backcasting, I think is the expression, where uh, we have the 10 year state, then we work back through sort of seven year, five year, and then the three year state is really what, what we can use to describe where we're going, how we're going to get there, at least in that sort of touchable um, three-year kind of state, which is still, you know, pushing the boundaries, pushing the technology, pushing the envelope. Um, but it's recognizing, I think, where customers can see and where we can see and where today's technology can take us. Um, and then we can start to share that, gain input, validation, and then take everybody on that journey, both internally as well as uh, our customers, take, a, take them along with us as we, um, as we create that future state. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Sasha, you know, any reactions to that, uh, the, what, what Peter has set the table with? Yeah, absolutely. It's actually been a really interesting exercise for us to work through 
you know, what, what, what is the 10 year? So how do we see our customers business different in, in that time frame? Uh, and we've, we've, we spent quite a bit of time actually working through this. And, the, you know, this has been a kind of a large group effort with a lot of people from our organization involved. Uh, but we did end up finally settling on six key areas of opportunity that were really important for our customers in terms of transforming their business and changing uh, our products for the future. And those six areas were, the first one was informed design exploration. And this is uh, an area where we have a lot of opportunity because it means that we can provide more information to our customers, put it at their fingertips. So as you're making a decision about your project, you are actually informed about the impact of your decision. So that at the end of the day, that means you can actually deliver better buildings or building better infrastructure projects. Uh, another area is automation and elimination of tedious and repetitive tasks. I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, we don't want you guys sitting there going click, 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 click. That's not fun for anybody. Uh, so the more that we can actually start to automate those picks and clicks, uh, the more you can actually focus on your job of actually designing uh, the built environment. Uh, the next one is designing for constructability. Uh, we all realize that uh, we want to have a tighter connection between construction and design so that, again, people can make smarter choices and better understand the impacts of their decisions. So if we can bring the aspects of constructability earlier in the design process, uh, that means that ultimately buildings can be delivered more efficiently. And I think that's really important for us in terms of changing how the industry works today. That's, you know, the construction industry, but also how it interacts with design. Uh, the fourth area is managing and reusing data. We realize that Revit models are huge areas of opportunity because there's so much rich data in there. The more that we can start to reuse that, make that available to you, make it easy for you to find something in a project that you did five years ago that maybe you can reuse rather than remodel from scratch. Uh, that's a key area of opportunity for us. That means we actually have to make the data more accessible and more consistent. Uh, and so that's been a really big focus for us. Um, fifth area is maintaining design continuity between workflows. We realize there's never going to be one model of the building. There are different representations for different purposes, but it's really important that we don't lose data as we transfer from one to the other. And then last but not least, supporting models as deliverables. I think this has been a topic for conversation for such a long time. Um, we can't change the industry ourselves, but we can certainly create products that support that transformation. It's a very broad list. So may, may I ask, are there any of those that you want to highlight? For me personally, and I'm the platform product manager, so this is kind of what, you know my bread and butter. Uh, for me, I think the uh, reusing and managing data is the most important thing that we can focus on, uh, largely because it is the foundation that supports all the other areas. So we can't do it unless we can actually do good things with our data. So the more that we restructure that, uh, the more that we will actually be able to deliver on these other promises. So uh, for me, it's step one. Uh, it's critical. And it's also what we heard from our customers. We've kind of run these ideas by customers at Autodesk University, user research sessions, and consistently the feedback was, if there's one thing we can fix right now, it's access to data and being able to ban better manage it. Uh, the I in BIM, as it were. Uh, what about you, Peter? Yeah, I, I think there was a few I was picking up on as, as Sasha was uh, talking about those key areas of opportunity. So I think um, I would reinforce how critical data flows are versus file formats. So we know how painful it is to, um, to you know, swap file format information and the whole interoperability um, things that we've been, we've been trying to work out for years, not only inside of Autodesk, um, but also when you mix Autodesk tools with uh, all the other vendors' um, uh, file formats, it's really tough. Um, and it's, t it's high time that we, we fix that. So um, we, we really are moving to data flows, not away from file format interop. We still need to do that. Um, but we certainly know that there are um, um, huge improvements that we, we can make if we have data flowing throughout our entire um, portfolio. And that's really why the Forge platform represents that data backbone. And you'll hear more about the Forge platform and you'll hear more about um, that sort of horizontal data platform going throughout, um, not just AEC, but also how AEC interacts with manufacturing uh, as well as with our media and entertainment um, products as well. 
Um, I also wanted to pick up on the automation. Um, so I think it is uh, down to us as technologists to use computing power to take away the mundane tasks that are repeated time and time again. And frankly, uh, you know, we, need, we can el eliminate a lot of that heavy lift work. But I do also want to downplay the fear factor that comes with automation. There is absolutely no way that the computer can replace the human elements um, that go into uh, the design, whether you're an architect or an engineer, a civil engineer, um, uh, you know, a bridge engineer, what, whatever. Um, we're absolutely not taking that away, but we do see automation of, of those repetitive mundane tasks as something that we just can do. And indeed, you know, we see that happening uh, throughout the AEC industry. So I just wanted to sort of de-fear the automation word. And then I also wanted to pick up uh, on, a, on a sort of a bigger topic as we think about the future state uh, for design um, on the infined, uh, informed, if I can say it, informed design exploration. So this is also called outcome-based design. Um, you can also hear words like um, uh, optioneering applied to this as, as well. And this is really trying to get design, early design decisions earlier in the uh, in the life cycle of the uh, of the project um, so if you think about um, any project is based on initially putting outcomes um, into the computer you're thinking about the height of a building you're thinking about building regulations the uh, the size of the site that's been bought or that's been assigned to the project or the length of the road um, and so on and so forth and the type of terrain it goes through if you can feed those outcomes into a computer to start to get a massed early conceptual design, then we know that that, is, uh, uh, that can save an enormous amount of time and effort and really get the project off to a great start, starting to share information between uh, all of the stakeholders on the project much, much earlier than we do today. So that helps people make better decisions earlier on. It saves that time, saves money, of course, enables a, a, better, a better built environment. And it's truly going to be transformative. It's gonna change the nature of the way that we design. And then of course, that early stage conceptual design needs to seamlessly work into the detailed design um, part of the, of, the, of the project, whether that's in you know, Revit or, or Civil 3D or the other design tools that we have and analysis tools that we provide as well. Thanks for that. And thanks for the shameless plug. We have. Uh... Just done an episode with Zach and Saul recently on automation. We're going to be doing a future episode coming soon on interoperability. So, so these are these are hot topics. Perfect. <laughs> um, Good. So it sounds like there's a lot to do. Can you can you uh, maybe elaborate on current status? Yeah, I, I mean we we do have a huge amount of of work. Uh, absolutely. Um, we're working hard on identifying uh, identifying areas of our uh, portfolio that we need to um, recreate um, or transform or extend. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, componentization. Um, we we also know that we have a lot of duplicate components across the company, so we can actually deduplicate and componentize uh, and modernize. Um, there's been discussion about thinning the client. Um, if you listen to Andrew Anagnostar, CEO, he draws parallels between what Fusion is doing and uh, where we can potentially take our design applications where you have a mixture of um, a thinner desktop capability, but leveraging the compute, uh, the compute power and capabilities for collaboration and coordination of the cloud. So that's something that we're looking at as well. Um, and really trying to also simplify the whole user experience. We have multiple different ways of doing multiple different things across all of our design applications. Um, I always use the Excel example. How many times have we reinvented different parts of Excel when actually we could be using Excel? Um, and those are the kind of things that we need to really focus on and see how we can dedupe and, and, and uh, simplify our, our uh, huge monolithic uh, applications. So a lot of work to do. I agree. There's a huge amount of work. I completely agree. It's, 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 it's kind of daunting in a way, but I, one of the things that I've been sharing with even our development teams is, look, 
we're already on that path. We're already doing a bunch of projects that are pushing us in that direction. And actually we've been working on them for a few years. Uh, so I, I wanted to highlight, I kind of want to take the opportunity to highlight a few projects that I think are interesting uh, to mention here. Um, one of them is this idea of rule-based coordination. And uh, that project is this idea of taking out some of the information from the model itself and storing it in a way that it start, allows you to start connecting two models to each other and building out that relationship. So say you have an architect and a structural engineer working together, uh, they can actually start to collaborate on, uh, on their two models without using something like Copy Monitor, which involves them linking their entire model and using that as a reference. Like, how do we actually make that relationship and that collaboration between either two people and possibly two different products um, or just two products and the same person, something like structural analysis and a physical model, how do we make allow them to work together better? And that's a really interesting area for us to explore. And, and essentially also, how do we start to allow you to create rules that define those relationships yourself so we are not necessarily defining them for you? So that's one project that I thought uh, is really interesting. Um, another one that I thought was worth highlighting is this idea of uh, storing parameter definitions in a way that's more easily exchangeable between firms. Uh, this is one project that we've been working on for a while and thinking about, but the first iteration of that to Peter's earlier point about componentization was taking the Revit's, unit, Revit's units engine, ripping it out of Revit, making it into a component, putting it back into Revit, uh, and then actually using that for, uh, for our Revit 2021 deliverable. But the reason that that's really powerful to put that into a component is as part of Revit 2021, we were able to add over 70 new units without a file format change or anything like that because we had this great component that we could actually add that to. And now this component is available to the rest of Autodesk and hopefully in the future beyond Autodesk as well. Yeah, the good, good ones. I, I wanted to pick up on... Um analysis as well, because we're doing some, I think, really interesting things around um, creating analysis platforms, thinking about using the cloud for that. Um, and also um, one particular product, Insight. Uh, Insight has been using um, a, an older engine, a sort of a, a faster but less able engine for quite some time. And we're really, really looking to move that to a different engine uh, and potentially also build that out so that um, uh, instead of just doing uh, the uh, building performance analysis, we can actually look at uh, the use of total or the uh, analysis of total carbon for um, a construct. I think that's uh, really interesting. And I think that sort of takes us to the next level. And then if we start to cloudify that as well as our, our other analysis tools, I think that becomes much more open, much more transferable, potentially even allows other vendors of analysis to come into um, our ecosystem as well and offer their tools to, uh, to the Autodesk user community. We are taking a very holistic view of analysis and thinking about uh, not only the individual disciplines and what we can do, but also how do we reformat that so that not every single analysis has its own complete unique interaction pattern to Peter's earlier point. Can we bring together analysis system so you can essentially plug and play whatever analysis that you actually need to use? And I think that's something that we're also thinking about going forward. Yeah, I can also comment on Project Terra as well. Uh, so Project Terra is an effort on our infrastructure side uh, to actually uh, take some of our modeling and again, move it out of the kind of entrapment of the, the file format and make that more into data that can be more easily exchanged uh, between our different products. Uh, and so we, what we've started to do is define what are those data types, how is that data stored so that we can start to exchange it. But it'll allow us to do much more efficient uh, exchange of data, not only between InfraWorks and Civil 3D, but also Revit, for example. We've started to move yeah. in that direction of easy exchange between all of, our, all of our products, but the more open we make that data, uh, the more accessible it will be to, be to Autodesk's products, but also uh, the third-party ecosystem, because all of this is being built on Forge to Peter's earlier uh, comments. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to sort of round that out with um, what we're doing around a proof of concept. Um, so again, this is an internal project, but I'm, I'm, I'm sharing it um, with uh, 
our viewers. Um, th this proof of concept is trying to take a number of these different aspects of what we're looking to do in the future and building it into a, um, um, uh, an early stage, um, well, um, test of all of these various different concepts. So there's a team working on that now, building this out now, um, and we're looking to have uh, some results from that in the reasonably early part of next year. Um, and uh, we'll see how much of that we can share with, uh, you know, with our external audience, but certainly, um, uh, you know, bring people into um, viewing that and validating the kind of direction of travel that we're going. But this is very much, you know, real. All of these things are projects that are going on at the moment and others besides. Yeah, just reflecting back on this as a, as a designer, I mean, there's a lot, a lot that you both have just offered. But this idea of informed design, this idea of making rapid fire design decisions at an early stage with better information is, is would be valu very valuable to me, as well as, uh, you know, if you're in the analysis use case, to be thinking about getting information as you are designing about the results of, you know, the impact of what you're designing in, in terms of analysis results is, you know, a powerful future. Uh, so uh, let, let, let me just back that up, because that's kind of the reason why um, putting analysis or, or connecting analysis up with the cloud allows you to do that. Whereas today, the, you know, the traditional way is to uh, kind of send it off to be uh, to be computed or use a separate um, piece of software. Whereas if you've got those two connected and you're using computer, uh, compute power of the cloud to do that in real time or on demand, it becomes much, much quicker. And then to your point, to have the experience where that analysis is always available to you in Canvas as you design, I think is hugely powerful. Uh, and, and that's very much the direction of travel there. Yeah, yeah. Our problem has always been this serial process. That's not really how design happens. You know. Yeah. Great info there. So, uh, any closing thoughts, Peter, on on what we've been talking about uh, today? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think the key message that we're we're uh, trying to put across is that uh, although we're talking about a bid vision that is a ten year future state. That's not the kind of thing that we've been talking about for the majority of this conversation. It is very much about here and now, but we are already moving uh, to that in that future direction. Um, we do need to find that balance. We need to fix the day-to-day -day challenges that we've been hearing very loud and clear, particularly over the past month or so. But really, you know, we, we've been uh, listening to those uh, voices for quite some time. So we need to fix those day-to-day -day challenges in the software. Um, at the same time, we are rethinking how our products work and we are undertaking um, projects and, and uh, development work in order to um, change the way our products work. We're also focusing on data, fly, data flows versus that file format pain point that uh, we all inflict on our uh, customers. Um, and we are actively building the future state. So I think these Inside the Factory events are very much about wanting to share the, what we're working on and you know, just share more of that um, with our audience and with our user base. Uh, we want to show the progress. We don't want to wait for you know, a year, two years, three years before we actually show what we're working on. We want to show um, progress and show how we're changing uh, both our uh, design applications as well as our analysis applications and using generative and outcome-based design. Um, and importantly, gain input and validation on the direction that we're going in. Um, and I think that's what you will see from us uh, over the coming months and, uh, and years, uh, a much closer engagement um, with, our, uh, with our customers as we go through this uh, change of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the design uh, um, uh, model that we have today. And Sasha? For, for me, it, the, the, I guess the exciting part is actually making it happen, right? Having that 10-year vision is, 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 is great. We, 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 we can see the future. We, we've actually been talking about the future for a long time, but actually transforming our products and taking the concrete steps that we need to take to get there, uh, that's the part that I'm really looking forward to. And this is, I, I think... That's why I really appreciate the fact that we've been we've taken the time to sit down and do the bid vision, do the bad casting, because we can start to make it very clear how we get to that state. 
And thank you, Sasha. And thanks very much, Peter, for joining us today. Uh, with pleasure. That, for the audience, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next time on Inside the Factory.